you're in the top 10 in Amazon for novelists who self-published, you're going to have agents coming after you. Yeah. No, I, I get that. So take a step back. Classical literature, access to information or knowledge, moving digital technology into the classroom seems somewhat heretical. Go to conferences, you get the same sort of blowback, even from publishers. What happens next in the transition of your work? And there must be a mutation in your teaching because now you're starting to see something quite novel here. Right. Yeah. So around the early 2000s, um, what I did was considered heresy, but then it soon became the norm mm -hmm. eventually. And when it became the norm, I got hired by a different school that was a tech school. They liked what I did because it was technology. Sure. And uh, they wanted me to teach their engineer, engineering students and computer science students about the crossover between humanities and technology. So it was just a matter of evolution. I went from, from teaching with technology to, to how technology changes people and society. And I got into writing about post-humanism, which was still new back then, 20-something years ago. Is there a crossover? Oh, yeah. I mean, because p transhumanism and its ultimate end, post-humanism, is all about incorporating technology into the human frame. So into how, body the, and mind. Okay, so that's the frame. Frame is body and mind. That's right. how it's defined. Right. So, for instance, transhumans um, modify themselves, are in favor of modifying themselves with technology for positive <clears throat> benefit. A book. So, and I talk about it a lot because it's interesting, especially what Musk envisions. You know, he doesn't stop at normal stuff. No. He gets pretty radical. His idea is that. He wants it to allow not only rapid communication with devices and the internet, but also rapid intercommunication between humans, like telepathy between humans via this device. That, for me, is kind of scary because that, what about privacy? How do you, how do you, you make understand. privacy then? You can't turn off this thing. And um, he also, you know, sees it as a way to keep humans from becoming obsolete compared to AI. Obsolete in what instance? He thinks AI will be so powerful that it'll make us obsolete for any kind of jobs, but that neural lace would be, allow us to compete with AI because we'd have very rapid abilities to analyze and, and absorb facts and all these other things. So then let me ask you something about your statement you just made. Okay. You sound smarter than you actually are. I know, I know. How does this then play to the point which I made about the fact, is it truly making humans evolve for the benefit of the human being? Well, yeah. I mean, if, if you can be smarter in some way because of a digital device, then you're smarter. I mean, if you want to go into the philosophical Oh, that's exactly that, what I'm I doing. know where you're headed with this. Of that, course you do. The cost-benefit analysis. Yeah, what is it costing us? Well, that cell phone is expensive for one thing, mm -hmm. and almost everybody buys one. Yeah. So if you're not flush with money, spending eight or nine hundred dollars for a smartphone is not an easy buy. The we see the view of transhumanism into posthumanism. Do they do posthumanists see it as truly a beneficial future? What seems absurd to me is that human beings would be competing against the thing they create. That just seems totally imbecilic in my mind. Talk to, you know, it does. And frankly, how could it not? And, 